there is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Let's open the Bible again to this wonderful chapter the pastor referred to a moment ago, John chapter number 17. This is our our text for the week. We're pitching our tent here, driving our stake, getting our tools out, digging around, and uh, trying to discover all the Lord has for us. You know, you never exhaust the infinite Word of God. So it doesn't matter how well you know the chapter. It doesn't matter how many times you go back to the chapter. Every time you go there, nothing new but something fresh. And I know the Lord has much to say to us tonight. How many of you did read it already today? Would you raise your hand? Ah, oh, these are the overachievers among us. Very good. Now, all the rest of you folks, you've got to catch up. So tonight, before you go to bed, don't you go to bed tonight without reading John 17. Uh, put, a, put a reminder on your phone or do something uh, to help you read it. Go to bed thinking on this great chapter. And then try to read it again tomorrow, uh, on Monday, before you come back to the evening meeting. And we're just going to keep going back to it and asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us as the Lord gave us this prayer. Look with me again at John 17. Let's go back where we were this morning. We, we examined the first 10 verses. I'll not re-preach all of that to you. But I want you to look with me at verse number 4. Remember, our Lord is nearing the cross. You know, the nearer you get to the cross, everything looks different. The closer you get to Calvary, everything looks different. And here is our Lord facing the cross. Listen to his prayer in verse 4. Oh, the passion in it. He says to the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Would you do something? It's not my message tonight. This one's extra, all right? Take your pen and just circle the word finished. Isn't that a glorious verse? It describes really the work of Christ from start to finish. In fact, in the same book, John chapter 19, do you remember what he would cry from the cross? It is, same word, it is finished. I've been pondering this. What, what did the Lord mean? What was he referring to when he says in John 17, I finished the work which thou gavest me to do? Now, some people have said that this was not the work of redemption he was referring to here. It was the work of reproduction. It was the work that he had done with his disciples. And I think in the context, I see that. He was saying the Father sent him to give the truth to these men so they would carry it on, and that work was now finished. He concluded the work of his earthly ministry this three and a half years, and now he's headed to the cross. Uh, but in retrospect, I think really this is an all-encompassing declaration. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Somebody said, but he's, he's not at the cross yet. He's, he's not suffered yet. No, but you must remember this. In the mind of God, it was already a settled fact. In fact, at the end of this chapter, our Lord says uh, to his Father, you've loved me from the foundation of the world. That's an expression that's found in another place in Scripture when the Bible says that our Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So let me really blow your mind tonight. Did it ever dawn on you before God ever created Adam, in the mind of God, Jesus was already on the cross? You want to talk about grace and mercy and love before God ever created man with full knowledge that that man would rebel and sin against him, God had already sacrificed his son. Oh, that's glorious to me. And I'll tell you what else it does. It removes any doubt about what's going to happen in the next chapter because I've heard some people preach that in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus, when he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, that he was trying to get out of the work of the cross. I, I don't believe that at all. I think that was already a settled fact in the heart of our Savior, and John 17 is proof of that. Finished. And read on, look at verse number 5, and now. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That little word with is an interesting word. Glorify thou me with thine own self. It is literally a word of total dependence. Oh, this is powerful. 
Here is the lovely Son of God who became a man without ceasing to be God, who laid aside the free expression of His glory, who veiled it with humanity for a moment of time, and here He stands on the darkest night of His life. What's He doing? Look at me, please. He's leaning on the Father. And He says, Father, I'm leaning on You. I'm leaning heavily on You. Glorify me with Your own self. May I say, it doesn't matter how weak you feel as long as you remember your God is strong. And when we come to nothing, it is a reminder that He alone is everything. And our Lord is saying to the Father, it's powerful, I know your glory hasn't changed one iota. It's the same glory we shared before all these people ever existed. Now, Lord, Father, let me, let me enjoy that glory with you yet again. And by the way, God the Father answered that prayer. I don't want you to do something tonight. I want you to mark the first two words of verse 5. We're prone to read over them, almost skim them, like they're incidental. But I would remind you there's nothing incidental or accidental or coincidental in the Word of God. Notice the present tense. Jesus says in his prayer, and, what's the next word? Now, mark it, and now. It's not the last time he'll say it. Would you come down to our text for tonight, beginning in verse number 11? words of verse 11 church hmm. and now I am no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee holy father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are while I was with them in the world I kept them in thy name those that thou gavest me I've kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that's a reference to Judas that the scripture might be fulfilled what are the first two words of verse 13, church? And now, how many of you know the Lord never uses words for filler? Like This is not just us saying, um. This is not just some man trying to think of what to say next. No, no. The Son of God praying these holy words to the Heavenly Father who knows all things and guided by the Holy Spirit pinned for us on the page of the Holy Scripture in verse 5, and now, O Father. In verse 11, and now I am no more in the world. Verse 13, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I want to speak to you tonight on this little subject, living in the now. Three times our Lord uses this expression, and now. It's significant because in the prayer, he goes back in his mind and he rehearses and reviews all that he has done in the past. All the disciples have seen, have heard, have witnessed, have experienced. He, he reviews some of that. Also in the prayer, he looks ahead. There's a perspective element in this prayer. He envisions the day when they'll all be one around the throne. When we'll all be together. Anybody else looking forward to that day? The glad homecoming day. So, so there is a past and there is a prospect, but yes, yes, there's a present. I'm glad to report to you tonight that the God of the Bible is always a present tense God. When Moses said, what's your name? I, I need a name, Lord. You're going to have to tell me a name so I can tell them who sent me. Our God just said, just tell them I am. I am what? Yes, all of the above. The self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal one. See, I can say I am, and i got to put something after it, fill in the blank. But God can just say, I am that I am, and that's enough. Why? Because he is the present tense God. He did not say I was, and he did not say I will be. He said I am because wherever you are, God is. God's not bound by time. He's not limited by where we are. He is in the ever-present, eternal now. Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us that our God is a very present help in time of trouble. I don't know what that does for you. That helps me. When you come to John 17, I, I've read this so many times, but it wasn't until this week that this really jumped off the page at me, the present tense, because watch 
Where is Jesus at this moment? He's walking with his disciples from the old city of Jerusalem across the cobblestone streets and out the gate and across the Kedron Valley and across that little brook that would have been running with the blood of the Passover lambs that were being slaughtered inside the city. He's running, walking across the brook, running with blood, knowing where he is heading. Where is he heading? He's heading to the garden. No, he's heading through the garden. And I tell you that it is on this night in the now that our Lord makes this prayer. It's at this moment where the disciples, filled with memory of the past and uncertainty about the future, are living in their now, and our Lord reveals in his prayer how all of God's followers can live victoriously in the now. You see, John 17 is not the prayer of a victim. There are victims in our world today. In fact, the reality is all of us in some sense have been victimized because we live in a sin-cursed world and we are sinners and we're surrounded by other sinners. We, we all are feeling the effects of the curse. We're in a world that's groaning, waiting for the Creator to make it all right again. But the truth is in our recent culture, everybody seems to claim the victim card. Everybody wants to be the victim. People have found out it's a quick way to pity. But I want to tell you that in John 17, the sweet son of God who's about to be hunted by Judas and these religious leaders and the soldiers who's, who's about to be taken in the middle of the night and mistrialed all night long until finally they say, crucify him. He speaks in John 17 not as a victim, but thank God forever as the victor. And I want to say to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you are not a victim either, friend. You don't have to live on the downside. You can live on the victory side because Christ has made us more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so when you come to John 17, the Lord is teaching us in his prayer. He's holding class, you see, in the prayer closet. He is teaching us in his prayer how God's children can live right now in victory and in power. The disciples have had three and a half glorious years with the Master. I mean, think. Put yourself in their sandals just for a minute, would you please? Think what they've seen. They watched him walk on water. They sat there and just kept coming back for more of the bread and fish, and the Lord just kept multiplying it. They had a front row seat to what the Lord was doing. They stood in the cemetery and heard him say, Lazarus, come forth. And he did. I mean, you talk about three and a half years. They heard every message that he preached. They just heard this amazing discourse in the previous chapters. Never a man spake like this man. So think of all the wonderful things. But watch, please. Jesus is teaching them in the prayer that his work in them is not a past tense work. It is a present tense work. May I say to every believer tonight, your best days are not behind you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ because the Lord is always at work in the present tense. I know people that get bogged down in the past. Some people get bogged down in the failure of the past and they think they got some big black X on their life and they can never get over it. I'm glad to report to you there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. When your sin goes under the blood of Jesus Christ, it releases the power of God to work in you right where you are. Some people get bogged down in the successes of their past because they think, well, you know, those were good days. I could never exceed that. No, you probably can't exceed it, but God can exceed all expectations. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think according to his power that it works in us, and it works in us right now. And then there's some people that think, well, we're just holding on to Jesus comes, and you know, someday we know it's really going to be great when we get to heaven. Or can I tell you, it is going to be great when we get to heaven. But God designed it so you can't just enjoy the destination. You get to enjoy the journey and the destination. You don't have to, no, no. You can have a good dose of the Lord's joy right now. You're not perfect. This world is not perfect. Your circumstances are not perfect. Nobody has a perfect situation. But we have a perfect God, and he is wonderful. And he's made it so we can live right now. Somebody said, in the sweet by and by. I like that song, and I like thinking about the sweet by and by. The reality is, though, we got to live in the nasty now and now. So how are you going to live Monday? Listen to me, church. Hear me with your heart. I'm not preaching for Sunday. I'm preaching for Monday. 
I'm not preaching for these gatherings where we all get together and feel such a great time of fellowship together. I'm talking about tomorrow when the devil is nipping at your heels and the sin-cursed world is slapping you in the face and the flesh is weak and you're wondering how you're going to make it through. I just want to remind you, Jesus said he would never leave you and he would never forsake you and everything may change, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know one thing I love about Jesus? He always deals in present realities. Not like we wish it was, not like it used to be, not like somebody else promised it would be. Exactly where we are, Christ meets us there. And I'm looking at a bunch of people. I don't know what you're dealing with, who you're dealing with, what's facing you tomorrow, but I know this. Jesus Christ is more than enough, and he made a way. He prayed it for you that you can live right now in victory. So how? That's the question, isn't it? Well, let's walk through the verses together. Would you take a pen out tonight? I want you to make a little list. And I want you to make the list come straight from Scripture. It's really not my list. It's the Lord's list. But I want you to make the list somewhere so that you can go back and meditate on this a little later. Matter of fact, you might want to carry it with you tomorrow. You might want to stick it on your mirror so you see it when you get up in the morning. That might help some of us. Or put it someplace you're going to see frequently. For me, that would be the refrigerator. But you pick the place, all right? Someplace you'll be reminded, this is how I can live now in victory. Here's the first way. How are you going to live? Look at verse number 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. Number one, would you write this down? We're going to make it. You're going to make it. We're going to live now, number one, through the power of the Father's name. You see, you have a heavenly father, and your heavenly father is identified here as the holy father. For the record, there's only one, and he's not on earth. He's in heaven right now. And I'm glad to say tonight that the holy father is my father. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm a child of the king. I thank God for my dad. My dad has a good name. We were talking about my dad earlier today. My dad has a good name. My, that good name has gotten me out of some trouble through the years too, let me tell you. I remember years ago, I hadn't planned to tell this, hadn't thought of it in a while, but I remember years ago I was driving as a young man. I was in college, had my mother and my sister in the car with me. That was a recipe for disaster to start with. But I was driving through the plaza in our hometown, and my mother said, my mother said, Scott, you're driving too fast. You're going to get a ticket. You don't know my mother, but she's a prophetess. That's what she is. She spoke evil into my life. And at that moment, I mean the moment she said it, Pastor, the siren went off, the lights went off. I saw it in the rearview mirror. You know that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Ugh, it's awful. I pulled over in an empty bank parking lot, sat there for a minute, and the guy came up to the window, and he was mean. Now, I'll just tell you, he was rude. There was no niceties about him, license and registration. He was having a bad day, I guess, and I was sick. My sister was laughing her head off. It was like Christmas for her, you know. I went back, or he went back to his car, and I sat there sweating it out, and he came back in a few minutes. He looked at my driver's license, looked at me, looked at my driver's license, looked at me, and he said, are you Roger Pauly's boy? Hmm. And I thought for a moment, wonder if he knew my dad before he got saved or after he got saved. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I am. And he smiled at me. He handed me my license back, winked at me, and said, slow it down. Have a good day, son. I heard angelic choirs sing the Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. You know what it was? Oh, oh, I had committed a crime. I, I deserved the penalty. But look, my father's good name changed everything that day. And I'm going to tell you something. We're all just a bunch of sinners, and none of us deserve any good thing. But aren't you glad you have a heavenly Father? And in a sinful world, He's a holy Father. And we're not bound by earth. No, no. Look, when we talk about the Father's name, see, in Scripture, names matter. A name means a nature in Scripture. It reveals the nature of God. So when God reveals Himself as Father, it's a revelation and reminder of the beautiful love of God. When we talk about Him keeping us through His own name, that name is the name of authority and the name of access and the name of abundance and the name of assurance. This is the name of my great God. He, he is the creator. Oh, yes, he's the mighty creator. But he is my heavenly father. Did you know, this may interest you, that if you start in John 13 
and read through to John 17, which I've challenged you to do. If you take John 13 through 17, God is referred to his Father 53 times. It's pretty amazing. You know what I think? Here's what I think. I think the closer the Son was getting to the sufferings of the cross, he was leaning more and more and thinking more and more and speaking more and more about the goodness of his Father. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's just something about getting to Dad or getting to Mom. You know what I'm talking about. Well, may I say to you, if that's what the lovely Son of God did, that's what every one of us ought to be doing right now. You know, some of us, we've lived a little while but we're feeling like little children that don't know what to do anymore. We feel like little children so weak and so frail. And how are we going to make it? I'm going to tell you how you're going to make it. You are going to live in the now through the power of the name of your heavenly Father. That's not all. Keep reading. Look at verse While I was with them in the world, Jesus said, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. For the record, the scripture is always fulfilled. Would you write down a second truth? We live now not only through the power of the Father's name, we live now through the protection of Christ's salvation. I am in his hand. I don't know about you. Let me just testify for a minute. I sure am glad I'm not in the government's hands. I'm glad I'm not in the hands even of just medical professionals. I, I'm glad that I'm not in your hands. I like you people, but I can't trust you all the time. I'm glad I'm not in my own hand, and I'm really glad I'm not in the devil's hands. No, I'm in the nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus. Guess where he is? He's in the all powerful hand of the Father. Jesus said, no man can pluck you out of that hand. Would you mark in verse number 12 this expression? I kept them. I like that. I kept them. See, he keeps all that are his. If you read the passage and study it carefully, compare Scripture to Scripture. In verse 11, he keeps us from division. He says, I want you to be one. In verse 13, he keeps you from discouragement. He says, I want you to have joy. In verse 15, he keeps you from the devil, from the evil one. In other words, everything that may come at the child of God, the Lord Jesus says, you can't handle that, but I got this one. I'll take care of this. I'm going to tell you what we need. We need a renewed faith in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Listen to me, church. If he's strong enough to keep you out of hell, he's strong enough to take care of the here and now. If you can trust him for heaven, you can trust him for whatever's staring you in the face tomorrow. I promise you that. How are you going to live in the now? You're going to remember that Christ protects all that are his. He puts a hedge about them and nothing and no one comes into your life except the Lord Jesus allows it. And even if he allows it, he has a certain limitation on that. I don't know about you. I'm glad to be in Jesus' good hands. Somebody said, well, what do you do with the second part of that verse, preacher? With Judas, who was lost. I've heard people say he was saved and then he was lost. So he was a real follower and then he lost that. I, that's not at all what Scripture is teaching and I'm going to prove it to you. Look carefully at the wording that Jesus uses. The Bible says, and none of them is lost but the son of what? Perdition. Look, he's just talked about the father and the father's children. What's he saying about Judas? Judas was never in the family to start with. He was never a son of God. He was always a son of perdition. There are those who are saved, and there are those who are not saved. And the Bible says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Thank God for that. He knows who belongs to him. And if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know he has his eye on you. Number three, would you look please? Well, the Bible says in verse 13, and now, come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Does anybody else find it odd that on the saddest night of his life he's talking about joy? And yet, isn't that just like our Lord? Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. Can I tell you how you're going to live now? You're going to live now through the power of the Father's name, through the protection of Christ's salvation. And number three, you're going to live now through the provision of Jesus' joy. Jesus says, I'm going to give you my joy, and my joy is going to see you through. Matter of fact, turn back a page in your Bible, would you please? Go back to chapter 15 for just a minute. Because he just taught them about this. Now he's praying this for them. Look at chapter 15, verse number 11. He's talking now to the disciples. These things have I spoken unto you, 
that my remain in you and that your joy might be full. I want you to do something. I want you to circle my joy, your joy. This is great. Look, whose joy is it? It's not ours first. It's Jesus' joy. But Jesus made it so his joy can be your joy. And if that were not enough, he says, I don't want you just to have an, a little bit. I want it to be overflowing. I want it to be fulfilled. My cup runneth over. I've met some cre- Christians that I, I think have the idea that the Lord is going to give them just enough so they can endure. I want you to know God doesn't want you to endure and exist. He wants you to enjoy his presence. Excuse me, it's not just a dab will do you and I'm just going to get enough to coast into heaven on fumes. No, no. The Lord gives an extra measure of his joy and he wants it to be fullness of joy. And the same writer, John, when he writes First John, will talk a great deal about fullness of joy. May I ask tonight, are you a joyful Christian? If I really want to know if you were a joyful Christian, I wouldn't ask you. I'd ask the people that do business with you. I'd ask the people that live under your roof. I really want to know. I'd ask your children. They know the truth. May I ask, are you so full of the joy of the Lord, exuding his joy right now, that a sad, broken-hearted, despairing world would look at you and say, I don't know what those people have, but whatever they have, I need that and I want that. Listen to me, church. This is the way Christ designed it. Even on his way to the cross, he had the joy that was set before him. And do you notice anything? In chapter 15, verse 11, the joy is connected to what Jesus spoke to them. Go back to our verse, chapter 17 and verse 13. Again, now come out of thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. God always connects his joy to his word. You want to know why there's so many miserable Christians? Because Christians aren't in the Bible like they ought to be in the Bible. You want revived joy? Hold on. Turn the news off and open your Bible. You can listen to all the commentators and prognosticators you want to, and even the ones you agree with can't give you what only Jesus can give you. Only Jesus can give you his joy. And God always connects joy to the Word of God. Let me just show you something. Take take a minute. Take a little detour. Go back to the Old Testament book of Psalms with me just a second. Go to Psalm 119. This is the great psalm of the scriptures. All but two verses in some way directly reference the Bible. It's amazing. Psalm 119, look at verse 14. The psalmist says, Psalm 119, 14, I have rejoiced. How how did you rejoice? In the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Do you see the joy connected to his testimonies? What's his testimonies? Right here. This is it. Here's God's testimonies. It's the Word of God. If somebody said to you tonight, I'm going to give you a million dollars. I'm just going to give it to you. You got a tithe on it, but you don't have to pay taxes on it. What do you think of that? Just going to give you a million dollars. Would you be excited? Oh, yes. Don't you get so pious and look at me like some spiritual giant and say, no. Yes, you would. But look at the verse. The psalmist says, you know what? If people could give me all the riches in the world, it would not exceed the joy that is coming to my heart through what God has shown me in the Bible. Do you remember when it used to be like that in your Christian experience? When the Bible was fresh and real and rich. And you couldn't wait to open it because God was speaking to you. Oh, turn over a few pages. You're still in Psalm 119, right? Look at the end of the psalm. He repeats it. Look at verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Can you see a little child with that look on his face of jubilation? He found something. And the child of God says here, I've been in digging around in the Bible, and I found some amazing things in there, and it brought joy to my heart. If you need a good dose of joy this week, could I challenge you? Get a good dose of the Bible in you. On our way back to our text, stop off in Jeremiah just a second. Let me show you another verse. Look at Jeremiah 15. Everybody knows who Jeremiah is, right? We, we use an adjective to describe him. He's not just the prophet. He is the what prophet, church? The weeping prophet. How would you like to be known as the weeping prophet? From the time I was a boy, I have had this mental picture. I'm sure you didn't, but I had this mental picture that poor old Jeremiah never had a happy day in his life. I really did. I had this mental picture that it just moped around and moaned around all the time and is always crying. And I thought, what a miserable existence. And then one day I was reading what he wrote and realized that couldn't be true because no man could have sustained the length of ministry that he had and the breadth of ministry he had if he had not had the joy of the Lord on the inside sustaining him. Watch this, please. When you get God's heart, 
You rejoice over what God rejoices over and you weep over what God weeps over. It's not one or the other, it's both. So you can be burdened and joyful at the same time. Look at Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Here's the source of his joy. Would you like to know where, what he was getting it from? Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. All right, so let's get real spiritual. How many of you like to eat? I love it. I tour America by restaurant. I mean, I, I eat as a hobby. I really do. And I'll eat, and I'll think, I'm not going to eat any more today. And guess what? I do. And some of you are thinking right now, what you're going to eat when the preacher finally starts preaching tonight. That's really what you're thinking about. Oh, wait a minute, Jeremiah said, I found something that fed my belly, my spiritual soul and hunger much deeper than that. He said, I found the Word of God. I've been feeding on the Word. And he said, that Word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm telling you, nothing thrills the soul like Jesus. And if you want to know him, get in the Word and let the Word get into you. They asked an aging George Mueller near the end of his life. They said, Mr. Mueller, you seem like after all these years you're a happy man. And Mueller, they said, laughed and said, I am a happy man. They said, well, what do you think is the secret of your happiness? Praying for all these orphans and never, never asking for a dime, but having to care for all these hundreds of, of uh, orphans and uh, yet keeping a happy spirit. What was the secret? He said, that was easy. He said, every morning I'd get out of bed, I would get down on my knees with the Word of God, and I would get my soul happy in Jesus. He said, I learned if I could get my soul happy in Jesus, then I could deal with any other thing that I had to do all through that day. That's pretty good advice for all of us, by the way. And then he said this. He said, for the last 65 years, he said, I've read through my Bible four times every year on my knees. Ponder that just a minute. Four times a year on his knees. And they said, old Mueller threw his head back and said, and for 65 years, I've been a happy man. Happy, happy, happy. Duck Dynasty didn't start happy, happy, happy. The happy, happy, happy people are the people who've discovered the joy that is found in the Word of God, and it'll help you right now wherever you are. Let's go back to John 17 finish our list. If you want to get through what you are dealing with right now and come out on the other side, on the victory side, you're going to live now in the power of the Father's name. Live now through the protection of Christ. Live now through the provision of joy. Number four, we live now through the perfecting of the Word. Keep reading. Look at verse 14. He continues this thought about the Scriptures. I have given them thy word, hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So watch. Oh, I love this. The word that brings joy also preserves you. The, wor the word of God that brings the, the gladness to your heart also is what protects you and preserves you from everything that's going on around you. I don't know about you. Maybe you haven't had this struggle, but I've battled with my mind in the last few months. Anybody else battle with your mind? Because we're hearing so much and we're seeing so much and we're getting inundated with so many things. And if you're not careful, you'll start listening to yourself. I'm going to tell you, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Someone said, for feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My hope is in the Word of God, not else is worth believing. There's only one person you can listen to and believe every day, and that's God through His Word. And I'll tell you what the Word of God will do for you. It will preserve you. It is all sufficient and it is all sustaining. Did you notice the contrast in verse number 14? I want you to circle the word word, that's the Word of God, and then circle the word world. Do you see the word on one side and the world on the other side? There's a constant conflict between these two, between what God says and what everybody else says, between what men think and what God declares to be true. And I'm going to tell you, if you're going to stay anchored in the Lord in these turbulent times, if you're going to come out on the victory side through these per perilous days, the only way you're going to do that is through the preserving power of the word of God in your heart and home. And then, would you write down the fifth one? Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Number five, you're going to live now, you're going to make it now through the prayers of your mediator. 
Remember Hebrews says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And then three chapters later, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible says that he ever liveth making intercession for us. I remind you of where we started this Lord's Day. Jesus is praying for you right now. I've heard about some men in this church who've been meeting for prayer and I like that. I like the idea of prayer partners. I think it's glorious. I think everybody ought to have a prayer partner. Frankly, it ought to start in your home. Your spouse ought to be your first prayer partner. Can I give you something that will encourage you? Even if you live alone. You ready for this? Every Christian in this room has two prayer partners. You have one with you all the time and one in heaven all the time. In heaven, you've got Jesus praying for you. And in your heart, you've got the Holy Spirit praying for you. I want you to know that's quite a tag team of prayer right there. You want to talk about a direct connection to heaven, this prayer line. The Holy Spirit is praying with groanings which cannot be uttered. When you can't even put it in words, when you don't even know what to think, when you just cry and say, oh God, help me now. The Holy Spirit's articulating the very mind of God and the will of God before the throne. And the Lord Jesus is speaking on your behalf to the Father. I tell you, we have a wonderful mediator there at the throne tonight. And I want you to know he gets his prayers answered. Could I just point one thing out to you before we finish our list? It is this. Did you notice what Jesus did not pray for in the chapter? He did not pray for relief. He could have. He did not pray for his relief, and he did not even pray for their relief. He just accepted and assumed they were going to have junk to deal with. They were going to have persecution and problems. Man that is born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. All that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You're not going to change that. But watch, Jesus did not pray for relief. He prayed for resources. He did not pray, oh God, Father, get them out of all this. No, he prayed, Lord, meet them right in the middle of it. Aren't you glad that instead of God getting you out of all your messes, instead he steps in the middle of the mess with you? Lord, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother had not died. That's true, but if I'd been here, you wouldn't see me raise him from the dead. How about those three boys, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, in the midst of the burning fiery furnace and the form of the fourth man walking around in there with him? Look, please, Jesus steps right in the middle of whatever you're going through, right in the midst of your now to prove that he is more than enough. And so we're going to make it. Through the prayers of the mediator. Number six, would you write it down? We're going to make it and we're going to live now through the preserving of Almighty God. Look at the end of verse 15. He says, keep them from the evil. God is able to keep you. I must tell you, we're weak. I'm weak. I want to yield to temptation. I want to throw in the towel. I want to give up. But you're going to make it. You're going to live through the preserving power of Almighty God. You are not able, but He is more than enough. Can I show you a verse? Turn to the end of your Bible, almost to the end, to the little book of Jude for a second. I had this verse on my mind this week. Take this verse. This will help you. Look at Jude, how it ends. It's where we're living, right here in the vestibule, leading up to the revelation of Christ in days of anarchy and apostasy. Look how it ends. Jude 24 and 25. Now, isn't that interesting? What's the first word of verse 24? Huh. Right where you are. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. When is he able to keep you from falling? Now and until the day you see Jesus face to face. One more and I'll be done. Go back to John 17. How are we going to make it, preacher? I don't know how we're going to make it. I hear lots of Christians right now talking like unbelievers. Could I encourage you, stop speaking in unbelief and speak in faith. Christian people ought not be wringing their hands and just talking about how bad the world is. They ought to be lifting their hands to God and talking about how good their God is. How are we going to make it, preacher? All right, look at our list. You're going to live now through the power of the Father's name, through the protection of Christ, through the provision of joy, through the perfecting of the word, through the prayers of the mediator, through the preserving of Almighty God. And number seven, hallelujah, the best is for last. We live now through the promise of a world to come. Look at verse number 16. They are not of the world even as I am what? Not of the world. Jesus said, I don't belong to this world, and my followers don't belong to this world. You know what he was saying? 
the best is yet to come for a child of God. Somebody said, what's it going to be like, preacher? Well, I don't know, but let me describe it like Jesus did. Out of this world, that's what it's going to be. Not of this world. What's the best day you've ever had here? Well, it, it pales in comparison to the eternal day you're about to enter into. What's the most beautiful place you've ever been? Well, it's nothing like the glories that follow. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard. It's not entered in the heart of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The Christ who in his first miracle saved the good wine, the best wine for last, I want you to know, saves the best for the child of God to the very end. I'm going to tell you how you're going to make it this week. You're going to make it this week by realizing this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And very shortly, we're going to be where John in the throne room of the Heavenly Father. How can we live now? We live now with an eye on eternity. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.